Support comes from St. Louis Public Library Foundation, helping the library serve children and their families with programs and services needed to become lifelong readers. More information about the foundation is at slpl.org. From St. Louis Public Radio. This is the Politically Speaking Hour on St. Louis on the Air. I'm Jason Rosenbaum. Later in the show, we'll explore whether Republicans are gaining a foothold with Missouri's trade unions. And we'll also dive into the state's complex campaign finance and ethics laws. First, Missouri's top statewide contest this year is for the U.S. Senate, where GOP incumbent Josh Hawley is seeking a second six-year term. The race is getting a lot of attention, both because of Hawley's high profile and how the Republican lawmaker is taking a noticeably aggressive approach with his opponent, Democrat Lucas Kuntz of Independence. Kuntz is an attorney and 13-year Marine veteran who lives in Independence. He easily won the August Democratic primary over State Senator Carla May. Lucas, welcome back to the Politically Speaking Hour on St. Louis on the Air. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jason. It's good to be here, man. I want to start the conversation by talking about immigration. You mentioned in the Missouri Press Association debate that you supported installing fentanyl detection machines, increasing the number of Border Patrol officers, and an end to catch and release. And I want to hit on that last point. Catch and release often refers to allowing undocumented immigrants to stay in a community while they await an immigration court hearing. What would be your alternative to that policy? Well, I mean, there are several that we could do. You could do remain in Mexico. So you just, you know, you'd have to stay in Mexico or wherever uh, you're coming in from uh, until your case has been heard. Or, uh, you know, you go back and wait until it's finished. And I think, you know, we recently saw a case uh, right here in St. Louis that uh, sort of highlighted why we need to end the catch and release program. And uh, that is a good segue to what I was going to talk about next. Ramon Chavez Rodriguez is accused of killing St. Louis police officer David Lee, and he actually pleaded guilty to a battery charge in 2022. But according to St. Charles County Prosecutor Joe McCullough, he was allowed to remain in the country while awaiting his immigration court hearing. So through this process, when it was learned that uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Rodriguez was an illegal uh, alien and in this country illegally, uh, a Division of Homeland Security uh, ICE Uh, was contacted with regards to his status as an illegal alien. Uh, They informed us that uh, they were aware of the fact that he was in this country illegally, that he had already been detained, that he had been issued a summons for court uh, in the future, and he had been released on bond. So as such, he was already in the system. He was awaiting a court date. So they were not uh, wishing to detain him any further. uh, And... uh, Normally in a situation, sometimes they will issue a detainer, which will tell us that we need to hold them for them. But since he had already been in the system, since he had already been issued a summons with a court date in the future, um, there was no detainer issued, so there was nothing for us to hold him on as far as his illegal status. That was St. Charles County Prosecutor Joe McCullough talking about why Ramon Chavez Rodriguez was able to remain out of confinement even after pleading guilty to a crime. What, what is your reaction when you hear that clip? Well, I mean, I think it's ridiculous, and and I think it's just, you know, the reason we are here is because we have politicians who don't really care about national security, they don't understand it, uh, and they don't want to fix the situation, right? They don't want to keep us safe because they like having this as a, you know, a political tool when campaign season comes along. You've seen that with Josh Hawley doing, you know, lying about me in all of his ads, including on the border. And, you know, for me, my background is, you know, I was a U.S. Marine. Uh, before I deployed to Iraq, where I led a police training team, I was actually scheduled to deploy to Iraq and lead a border team. And so, you know, as part of the training to lead a border team in Iraq, I went down to the southern border in Arizona. I trained with the Border Patrol. I was sort of certified by the Border Patrol Tactical Unit. And, uh, you know, there are very clear solutions to many of the problems that we have come through the border, you know, ending catch and release so we don't have situations like this one stopping the flow of fentanyl by putting fentanyl scanners in at the in, in at the border and ports of entry because you know fentanyl is top killer of people in the state 44 years and under and uh, and then we got to fully fund and fund and equip border patrol uh, so that they can enforce those laws and so that again we don't in, end up in situations like we have with this one and you know the guy I'm running against is one of those people who is a problem on this because 
you know, when Roy Blunt negotiated, our former Republican senator negotiated a border bill that Donald Trump signed, Josh Hawley voted against it. He voted against funding for fentanyl scanners. He voted against the recent bill uh, up in Congress that the guys I trained with, the Border Patrol Union, actually endorsed because it would have fully funded and equipped them. And, uh, you know, he's just happy to have this as a campaign issue rather than keeping us safe. But I think that's sad. You know, as a Marine, my job is to see problems, fix problems, move on to the next one, right? And I, I just wish we had politicians who felt the same way. One of the other major challenges here is the asylum process. I was listening to an interview with former North Dakota Senator Heidi Heitkamp, and she mentioned the reason why there's such a chaotic situation at the border is that a lot of people are coming from places like Venezuela, El Salvador, Honduras, and they're claiming asylum because of political persecution or race or religion. So how do you thread the needle here where you allow for legitimate asylum claims while weeding out people who are just coming here to work or maybe coming here to sell fentanyl? Well, you know, El Sal- you mentioned El Salvador, and I'll just bring this up as an example for how broken it is, right? El Salvador has a lower murder rate than any country in the Western Hemisphere other than Canada. Like, that's it. Like, they're number two on one of the safest places to live. And so it's just why they have, you know, a protected nation status or a favorite nation status on that and uh, for asylum seeking. And it's just, it's ridiculous. It needs to be updated. Uh, but again, nobody cares about solving this problem because they all want to keep it as a political football uh, for, you know, for their November elections. And, uh, and I think, you know, if we want to process these claims, if we want to, like, make it happen swiftly, if we want to keep ourselves from getting in trouble, you got to do what I talked about. And you got to fully fund and equip Border Patrol. You got to make sure you have enough courts, judges, everything like that. And the thing is that we just, we don't invest in that. He has accused you in those ads of supporting, quote unquote, amnesty for immigrants. I I feel like you deserve a chance to respond to that claim. I mean, he's accused me of all sorts of crazy stuff. I mean, he said that I'm going to give, you know, all legal immigrants gold-plated health insurance that Americans don't even going to get, you know, don't even get. I'm going to put them all on Medicare. It's all it's all just what he's trying to do is, again, rile people up because he doesn't want to run on his own record. He doesn't want to run on his own record. He doesn't have one. Is there certain instances, though, where you would want to have a quote unquote pathway to citizenship? Or would that only be people people who came into this country legally? You know, I think we have to figure out a a situation where we resolve the current crisis that we have. And, uh, you know, I do think, you know, when I think of certain Afghan interpreters, Iraqis that I work with, you know, um, I think we need to find a pathway for people who helped us. Uh, I think if you can pass a background check, you know, that should be something that's really strong in, in favor for you. But uh, but again, like the guy's just making stuff up. That's what he does on everything. We're talking with Lucas Kuntz, the Democratic nominee for the U.S. Senate. I want to move on to abortion, which you talked about when you were last on the show. And since then, Democratic presidential nominee Kamala Harris has said she would support making an exception to the filibuster to pass a federal law codifying Roe versus Wade, which would allow abortion everywhere to what's known as fetal viability, usually around 20 to 24 weeks. Would you support getting rid of the filibuster for that purpose? You know, first, if we're going to talk about abortion, like, let's talk about women's reproductive rights. And uh, the guy I'm running against, Josh Hawley, is the worst member of Congress on women's reproductive rights. I mean, uh, you know, I, you probably saw how IVF was banned in Alabama for a little bit a while ago. Mm-hmm. Well, it may surprise people, but in 2013, Josh Hawley literally pioneered the legal argument for why in vitro fertilization, the morning after pill, and other types of contraception should be considered the same thing as murder. He wrote an article in the Springfield News Leader saying all of those things. I mean, I guess he's cutting edge, but to me, it's in all the wrong ways, right? He's voted against protecting IVF twice. He's voted against protecting contraception. He brags about being on the Hobby Lobby case that made it so that your employer doesn't have to cover contraception for you if they don't want to. Uh, He's voted against protections for pregnant workers. And, uh, you know, he has co-sponsored a national abortion ban that would override the will of Missouri voters this fall, even if we do change our our constitution uh, to essentially codify Roe versus Wade like you're talking about. And, Dale, so for me, um, you know, I just want to be very clear that the guy I'm running against is the single worst one before you even get to the filibuster, right? And so when we talk about the filibuster, um, I want to get rid of the filibuster. I don't want to get rid of it for, like, a specific reason. I want to get rid of it because what I think that the filibuster do does is it allows – 
you know, big corporations, federal lobbyists, people who buy off, you know, weak-minded political individuals like Josh Hawley to have to buy off fewer and fewer of them, right? When the threshold becomes 60, it's a lot easier to just buy off a couple people than if the threshold is 50. And so for me, I think the filibuster is a tool to maintain a status, a status quo that just doesn't work for most of us. And like, it's already hard to pass a new law in this country, right? You've got to get, you got to get the House to agree. You got to get the Senate to agree. You got to get the president to sign off on it. And uh, and so I think just the filibuster is one extra hurdle that I don't think we need. And I think it's holding us back. Interestingly, retiring West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin refused to endorse Harris because of this stance on carving out the filibuster for Roe versus Wade, contending it could backfire if Republicans took over the Senate. Is he wrong? Like, this isn't about Republican or Democrat. If the Republicans have control of the House, the Senate, and the presidency, and they pass a law, then they should be able to do that, right? Same for Democrats. Like, the way that people get held accountable, like, the way people get held accountable in this country is through elections. And so if they're going to pass a bad law, then the other side gets to run on that and gets to try to beat them. I think that's how it should work. And what we have right now is we have a stalemate that, you know, keeps a status quo in place and makes it much harder for us to overcome people like Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema, who are, in fact, bought off. I want to move on to LGBTQ rights because you mentioned ads that Josh Hawley is running against you. He has really spent a lot of time attacking you on this front, including an ad that says you are in favor of gender transition surgery for minors. And I want to just make it clear that health care treatment is almost non-existent for transgender minors. It, they almost exclusively do puberty blockers or hormone therapy. But you did say several times during the 2022 campaign you supported, quote unquote, gender affirming care for minors. And I want you to say what you mean by that and also kind of get your reaction about why Holly is attacking you on LGBTQ rights. Well, again, all he's doing is attacking me uh, literally on everything he can make up. Right. I mean, he said I was going to take away everybody's pickup truck keys on day one. I'm in office like it's absolutely it's crazy. Right. And uh, and so he's attacking me on this. Because, again, he doesn't have a record that he can stand on. I mean, if he got up and ran on his record, his record would be robbing Missouri taxpayers of $250,000 to cover for his own ethics violations. It would be how he wrote a self-help book called Manhood and made half a million dollars on book sales and book deals while he was supposed to be doing his Senate job. It would be about how he writes or he signs on to amicus briefs in support of his family members' cases to help him build out his family business. It would be how he hasn't brought any money back to this state. I mean, you know, and let's compare that to a prior Republican, Roy Blunt. Like, Roy Blunt brought $300 plus million a year back to this state uh, in congressionally directed spending each of his last years. Josh Hawley, zero. Like, is the guy really going to run on the fact that he's going to cost us $2 billion over the next six years? No. So he's going to just make up stuff about me. I mean, you know, he said we can't, like, we can't afford another six years of me in power or something like that. It's like, well, I don't know what he's talking about, right? And, uh, and so you're right. No, those ger- gender surgeries aren't happening here. I do think that kids should have access, you know, to therapy and other things that they might need, somebody to talk to, mental health services, um, so that they can figure out their lives and, and where they're going to go forward. And so for me, it's just, uh, again, like, uh, the guy just wants to make things up. You know, he said I was going to put men in women's lockers rooms. Like, he's, he's just... Um, He will make up anything in order to try to distract from his record and the fact that I'll actually deliver for this state. I think this is actually a pertinent issue in terms of Holly because he was very active in going after Washington University's transgender clinic after a former employee wrote a lengthy op-ed for the conservative website, The Free Press. Full disclosure, my wife works for Washington University. I'm an adjunct instructor at Washington University, but I have no connection to the Washington University Transgender Clinic, but I'd like to disclose stuff just so people know. Do you think that he was wrong to go after that? Would you have done that if you had been senator over the last couple of years? I think that the man sees sex change surgeries mandated for minors around every single corner. I mean, he said that Amendment 3 should, you know, to codify women's reproductive rights into our Constitution. Uh, was going to force sex change their uh, surgeries on minors, right? Like the guy tries to find hot button issues. He rants and raves about them. You know, he loves to yell at people. He met, loves to make a big scene, but he doesn't actually like actually care about doing work. And so the thing that I, I find frustrating on a lot of this, and I think that Missourians agree with, is you know, as our U.S. senator, the, the things that he's done is refuse to help us to bring money home, but he also wants to decide how we get to live in every single aspect of our life. I mean. He has said that we shouldn't have access to no-fault divorces anymore because, you know, uh, I guess women shouldn't should be trapped in unsafe marriages. And it's just uh, I don't know why he's obsessed with controlling all of us. 
I don't know why he's got to yell so much. I don't know why he uh, is like this. But I think that I really think that everything he does is to mask uh, the things that he's not doing and the things he doesn't want to talk about. Based off that answer, I'm guessing you would not have gone after the Washington University transgender clinic like Josh Hawley did. I, so I'm not familiar with exactly what he would have done. Um, you know, I do think it's the a senator's job and that it's Congress's job to run investigations into, uh, you know, what's going on in our country. So, you know, maybe it was something worth investigating. But uh, I will say that from what I've seen out of the man, most of the things he does is for attention, not to actually do work for Missourians. I want to talk about tariffs because you mentioned during the Missouri Press Association debate you were supportive of placing tariffs on China. First of all, I want to make sure that's accurate, correct? Yes. Okay. So former President Trump has talked about placing tariffs across the board on all U.S. imports. And numerous economists have said that would mean higher prices for consumers. That's what Kamala Harris says when she's talking about that in in a debate. Why is that plan that Trump has put forward a good idea for the working class that you have talked about wanting to uplift throughout the past couple of years? Well, so what I'm talking about when I'm talking about tariffs is tariffs against countries who are cheating. And uh, and so when I when I say that, um, you know, I was at the Pentagon. I was a Marine for 13 years. I deployed to Iraq, Afghanistan twice. And then uh, I spent four years at the Pentagon. And, you know, for part of that time, I did procurement. We did a study where we found that you couldn't build a a single major U.S. weapon system without inputs from China. You know, the organization, the procurement organization I was with, one of our goals was to bring in cutting edge technology for the warfighter, basically. And so we're talking battery technology, energy technologies, uh, you know, space technologies, uh, small drone technologies, kind of what the technology of the future is going to be. And, uh, you know, while we were doing that, one of our big competitions to try to create an entirely new U.S. um, production facility for just production at large or or uh, industry was small drones and so uh this is the reason i'm bringing this up because it's a good example of where we need tariffs and we need to use american muscle and so uh what we found was that there were only two places in the world you could really get a small a small drone uh, one was a small company in france with limited production and the other was dji in china which i'm sure most people have already heard of and, and so what DJI did, or what China did, is, you know, they saw this as a technology of the future. They invested heavily in it. They used, you know, they, they saw the way that the West uses free market to sort of determine who the winners and losers are and determine what businesses survive. And so they heavily subsidized their own business. They undercut everybody on prices to make sure that, you know, they essentially use monopoly power to run everybody out of business so that they could sort of secure the corner on this market. They do that on many, many things. And, uh, and it's not a free market. I believe in the free market. And when another country is going to, you know, use national power to take away the free market, I think we have to fight back. And I think tariffs make sense. And so, you know, generally the bad actor is China. And I think there's a lot of industries and sectors where we need to use tariffs against them. Uh, but I'm not against using it against other countries if they're going to, you know, likewise take advantage of the system we've built. But if ne- I, from that answer, it doesn't I don't get the sense that you're in favor of putting a 10% tariff on every country, including countries that are not bad actors. Is that fair to say? Yes. That, no, I don't want to do that. But I do think that tariffs are a, a tool in the toolkit, and we shouldn't shy away from them when another country is you know, monopolizing a sector and making it so we can't produce there. Let's move on to the political side of this race. Why do you think Josh Hawley has been so aggressive in attacking you both on the air and I guess, uh, coming up to you at the state fair and elsewhere during this campaign? Well, I don't think we have to guess. I mean, it's fear. He knows he's he's unlikable. He knows that his positions are completely out of line with everyday Missourians. And, uh, and he's, you know, he's losing it over that. I mean, you talk about the state fair. You know, it's funny because a year ago I went to the state fair and Josh Hawley was there. And I never met the guy before. So I was like, oh, maybe I should go up and meet him. And so walked up to try to meet him. And uh, he did what you would have expected at the time pure January 6th all over again, you know, skittered out of there as quick as he could and refused to say hi to me. Uh, This year, though, I mean, I guess he spent the year in between rereading his book on manhood over and over again because, you know, totally different story, right? And it was just, it was wild to see what a U.S. senator, when they become afraid, will do. I mean, you know, I'm standing there talking to this farmer named Wes just hanging out. Wes Schumeyer, former state senator. I've actually been to his farm. Have you ever been to his farm? Yeah, yeah. Wes it's and a, I have hung out. It's an amazing farm. Yeah. So. I'm also not a farmer, so I'm impressed by <laughs> farms. Well, I obviously. think you'd find a lot of impressive farms around the state. We just had an event up in Palmyra the other day to, at uh, one of his friend Lowell's properties, and it was nice. But, uh, but yeah, so I'm, I'm there hanging out, to, hanging out with Wes, and, uh, you know, we just hear this ruckus behind us, and we're like, 
Uh, we kind of ignore it at first, and it gets louder, and then we hear my name, like, Koontz, Koontz, has anybody seen Koontz? Is Koontz out of his basement? And we're like, what the heck is that? And uh, I turn around, and like, sure enough, our sitting U.S. senator is literally plowing through, like, crowds of people, you know, calling me out and yelling for me like it's Friday Night Smackdown, WWE style. And, uh, I mean, all mic'd up, camera crew trailing him cutest little western outfit you have ever seen i mean pearl snaps uh it was a beautiful thing i'll give him credit for that but it's just like the man is afraid he's doing the most outrageous things because he knows people aren't with him and uh you know our polling is getting closer and uh it's you know sometimes it's sad to see uh what a guy will do when when the pressure cooker sort of cranks up but here we are at the missouri press association forum holly repeatedly asked you if you were going to support kamala harris's candidacy and you responded the way you did on the show in july where you said you're focusing on your own race and you're not going to tell people how to vote for president first of all i want to make sure that i'm accurately yeah. summarizing it what do you say to missouri democrats who hear that and they're put off by that sort of statement because they really like harris and want to see their u.s Senate Democratic candidates support her openly. Well, I mean, this isn't for Democrats or alone, like this Democrat, Republican, independent. You know, what Josh Hawley wants to do is he wants to make this race about the presidential politics or something like that because he knows he's way less popular. Um, he's going to do way worse than President Trump, and he knows that he's betrayed Missouri. And so, again, this is just another – he's doing ads that lie about me. He's doing everything he can to try to distract – from the fact that he doesn't bring any money to this state, that I grew up here, that I understand how people live, and that I want to invest in this state. And uh, and for me, like I didn't get into this race to decide who the president was going to be. I got into this race to invest in Missouri, to take care of the people in my old neighborhood who brought food by the house when my family went bankrupt. And that's what I'm focused on, and that's what I'm going to be working toward every single day. Lucas Kuntz is the Democratic nominee for the U.S. Senate. We've invited Josh Hawley to come on the show, and we're hoping to have the GOP incumbent senator on this program soon. Lucas, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks again for having me. Today's episode was produced by Jason Rosenbaum. Our audio engineer is Aaron Dorr. This podcast was mixed and edited by Aaron. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. The Gateway brings you the day's news each weekday from around the St. Louis region and the state capitals in Jefferson City. Our schools are accredited. We don't need this bill. And Springfield. How many more years must pass before lawmakers see time is of the essence? I'm Abby Larico. Join me each weekday for The Gateway on the STLPR app or wherever you get podcasts. Mm -hmm.